your ways are better I'm not on the fence no. Who distributes joy? Who, who sets the soul free? Who can forgive sin? Jesus, who died for me? Yes, it's true that I've been captured by your love I've been captured by your grace I've been covered by your blood I was lost but now I'm found Yes, it's true you hold me down Jesus is my white flag I surrender right now Jesus is my white flag I surrender right now I surrender right now Jesus heard my white flag. I surrender right now. Right now. Right now. I surrender right now. Take a hiatus When the descendant of David's proven he is the greatest You see he mediates He is the mediator Now I am so free What a sweet savior Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. We are now in the year 2015. For all of you that prepped for 2012, I'm sorry. I'm glad, though, that that's done and over with. Uh, one of the things that God has been very clear with me about is that I'm not, as a minister and a child of his, supposed to really pay a ton of attention to the dates that occultists set, which really 2012 was, uh, based on a very occult society, the Mayans and their calendar, um, that, that occult date setting is really hit or miss. It's really a bad sense. And so um, that is done. That is over with. And now we are in 2013. Praise him. But I believe that we are on the precipice of something great within the body of Christ, his people. I think that God has it in mind to change a lot of things, to change the way things are done, and to get a company of people on board with a very, very exciting agenda. That's, really, I, that's truly what I believe. And, you know, one of the things I like to talk about a lot is the bride of Christ, because I believe that what God wants to do is ultimately going to be done through his people. I believe that. And, and I believe that while he is sovereign, uh, we are his vessels. We are co-laborers with Christ. And so if we're going to see God do something great, we can pretty much expect to be a part of that, which is the exciting thing. Tonight, we're going to be having a discussion, and I'm not having a guest. Uh, I am kicking off the year Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall, you are going to be hearing from me, my thoughts, and uh, on some very, very important concepts I really strongly believe in, and uh, that are very close to my heart personally, and, and I, I think that you know this is exactly what the Lord wanted as well. Um, I had thought to have a guest on tonight, but that came to a quick close, and as I reassess the situation... Um, man, you know, it seemed like God has this thing all taken care of already. So I want to welcome you, first of all, if you've never listened to this program before. My name is Daniel Duvall. I am the founder and president of Bride Ministries. Now, you can visit us at www.bridemovement.com. That's www.bridemovement.com. At our website, you'll find links to the archives of this program, 
you'll also find a link to my blog, uh, years in, of uh, in-depth teachings on various topics that I find uh, very relevant to the things that God has called me to communicate. You'll also find information about what we believe, the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, uh, and, and you'll also find other resources. I am the author of Noah's Ark and the End of Days and also Wounded by Leadership. Now, if you've never read either of those books, I strongly recommend as the author, get, get, get your hands on a copy. Noah's Ark and the End of Days is uh, my introduction to how God has led me to understand and perceive the last days. It is going to be fairly all-inclusive. It, it talks about the issue of the Nephilim agenda. It's going to talk about the issue of fallen angels and that agenda. It's going to talk about the seals, the trumpets, the bowls of God's wrath. It's going to talk about um, all of these things in addition to the story of Noah and how the story of Noah breaks down into types and shadows that describes some of the plans that God has for his church in and through the last days. It's um, a deep read, powerful read. It's going to give you a lot of information, connect a lot of dots that I believe have not been connected before um, in a way that I think is very relevant and also readable. And so get your hands on that if that is something that you're interested in or not. You know, um, you never know. You might start reading it and say, wow, this is something God is really speaking to me through. My other book, Wounded by Leadership, talks about how to overcome the wounds that we take from injurious leadership in the church. So many Christians, so many Christians that I have met, and, and it's just more and more as I uh, go forward in this thing, have come out of a situation where they have really been hurt by leaders in the past, and spiritual leaders, particularly um, you know, anyone that's actually spent time in any kind of organized church. And a lot of times what this has led to is great discouragement, distrust, boundaries between them and the destiny that God has for them, uh, a lot of negative works in, in their lives, and it's stemming from this problem. So I wrote the book because this problem was my problem, and I say was because God showed me how to overcome these things. And, and he gave me tools. And he, and he gave me experience. And on the tail end of my personal journey, I wrote the book on how God led me to overcome all these things and ultimately to walk out into his plan as he purposed for me. So you want to get your hands on that. If that was your experience, this book is extra readable, written to be read. I mean, this thing could be swallowed in a couple hours. And that's exactly what I wrote it for. Um, if you don't like books, because you don't like to read a lot, that won't be your problem with Wounded by Leadership. Now, um, if you're interested in calling in during the show, talking to me, if you have a question, maybe a comment on some of the things I'm saying, I welcome that. The call-in number that you can reach me at is 718-766-4160. That's 718-766-4160. I'll try to give that out again at some point later on in the program um, in case at that time we have other people um, tuning in, maybe aren't in for this part of the program. Um, I do want to say I just got back from Future Congress, which was held in Dallas-Fort Worth, the, the uh, Hyatt Regency Hotel in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And... Uh, Wow, was that a good time. Um, I'm so thankful for Mr. Hitt and, and Mr. Sharp for having me as a guest, inviting me, allowing me to speak there. Met a, a lot of wonderful people, uh, other ministers, doing similar things to what I'm doing. Uh, several people that I plan to have on as guests in the future. I am really excited and uh you know, it, it's just amazing to see what God is doing in his people, waking people up to, to not only the reality of the situation, but also the fact that he has a desire to do something about it. And so um, let's get to the material. What am I going to talk about today? The subject of our conversation 
is preparing a bride and moving towards sheep nations. Preparing a bride and moving towards sheep nations. The ministry that I have founded is called Bride Ministries. And the reason that I call it Bride Ministries is because I believe in the Bride of Christ. I believe that God is preparing for His Son, Jesus Christ, a bride that is fitting, a fitting reward for His Son. And I believe that it is the job of His ministers in these last days to prepare His people to be a bride that is going to be a fitting partner for His Son into eternity. And I, I believe firmly that this is a major central theme of all things having to do with biblical eschatology. Bridal themes. So where do we start here? Where do we start to, in order to talk about the bride of Christ? Well, you know, um, and I, I do want to say this. The church is just as much the bride of Christ as we are the body of Christ. I, I don't want anybody to get mixed up. We, the church is compared to both. Okay, the church is compared to the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ, not even compared to. We are. Um, and the church is also, it is said of us that we are the bride of Christ. And so um, those two terms can be used interchangeably, speaking to different aspects of the nature by which we relate to God. But when we're talking about this bridal concept, uh, one of the things I want you to know is that this is one thing that is all over Scripture. All over Scripture, bridal themes. And, and I want to bring out three main verses because uh, these verses are so central to helping us understand what God is saying about His bride in the last days and ultimately His purpose for us as His bride, the bride of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.23 says this, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of of the body. In this verse, we find that Christ is compared to the husband and the church is compared to the wife. And it says that Christ is the head of the church. He's also the savior of the body. So we have them both church, wife, bride, body. Um, Ephesians goes on to say, two verses later in verse 25 of chapter 5, husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish." I want you as listeners to really get this. This verse is so, so, so important because it describes something that a lot of us have, have absolutely missed as we have looked to the last days and to things that God is doing. Sure, we look to the famine and pestilence, and sure, we look to the Nephilim agenda, because, oh, isn't that so exciting to talk about? Which it is. Um, you know, uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. Why were the pyramids there? Were the Nephilim involved? What about, you know, ancient civilizations that disappeared out of nowhere? What about Atlantis? Can we make any relations to the face on, on, on Mars? And, 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 you know, all of these questions, and when we try to tie that in and say something is building for the last days, UFOs, this, that, and so forth, and then, you know, we say, well, you know, just come quickly, Lord Jesus, while we get excited about looking at these things. But one thing that we seem to have missed is the fact that God says in his words that he wants to present himself a glorious church. I asked this question at Future Congress. In my third talk, I asked um, those that were listening, I said, how many people in here would describe the church today global, worldwide, as something glorious. Glorious. Something glorious. 
And I raised my hand. I said, show me with your hand raised how many people here would do that, would, would describe the church as something glorious. And guess what? I did not see a single hand get raised. Big surprise? Absolutely not. Man, we all know there's stuff wrong with the church, man. I meet so many people like, man, I'm so sick of church. You know, people got, they, they went to a church, got gossiped against, got slandered. They felt uncomfortable. They weren't welcome. Then they went, they got no life imparted to them. They, there was no, no power in the gospel. The glory of God wasn't there. The presence of God wasn't there. They just went, it was like ritual. And they said, you know, I'm, I'm suffering all these problems. I'm not even encountering Jesus Christ in this experience. What am I doing here? So many people have so many problems, I can't even begin to describe the number of problems that I have myself become aware of that other people have experienced, including myself, in the church. Yet God says this fantastic concept. He says, I want to present it to myself glorious. Now, the first thing that people will do when they look at this verse is say, <laughs> that's funny, because it is. Because it's almost laughable how bad things are today. The division, the strife, the, the envy between ministries, the, the doctrinal differences that exist throughout Christendom. We ask, <laughs> what, we're going to be presented glorious? Really? No, no, that's not us. We need to be saved. That's what we need. We need to be saved. We need God to catch us up out of here as quick as possible. Because this is hopeless. I say, it doesn't matter what's going on today. What matters is what the Word says. And um, when the Word presents the fact that God has an agenda to present himself a glorious church, it means that he plans to execute that agenda in light of whatever manifests itself in the earth. Which is scary, which is exciting exhilarating for me, um, just uh, the last thing in the world many Christians want to hear. But that's okay, because I'm going to tell you anyway. This is Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. And one thing, if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this show, it's truth. It's truth. Um, and so, let's, um, let's go ahead and proceed a little bit forward. I want to uh, bring up another verse, Revelation 19.7. And um, it says this, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Revelation 19.7. This verse was one of the biggest slap in the face, wake me ups of all of scripture. When God hit me with this, I said, wow. 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 God. Wow. The thing is, one of the concepts that we find in scripture, whether we're willing to believe it or not, is the concept called the finished work. What is a finished work? It means Jesus finished it. He finished. The Bible says we walk in the works which were finished from the foundation of the world. It also says that Jesus trampled upon principalities and powers, triumphing over them, making an open show of them in it, taking the keys of hell and death. He has all power, all authority, all dominion, all honor. He got all of this and then gave it to his people in the act of his death, burial, and resurrection. It's called a finished work. It means that we walk in the victory that Jesus Christ purchased at Calvary. We have access to all the resources of heaven itself. The Bible says, I love this verse, For you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 1.3. What does that mean? That means that in the realm of the third heaven, the, the realm of God's dominion where he is king and his throne is, he has appointed unto us every blessing necessary for our lives and prepared them 
to be retrieved and brought in to this world by our faith and cooperation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Corinthians, for all of the promises of God are yes in him and amen in him to the glory of God through us. In other words, and I remember when a pastor pointed this out to me the first time, I was just blown away. That means that all of the promises that you can find in Scripture are already answered yes on God's side. In other words, for all of the promises in Scripture, God is waiting to give His amen to our yes. He said yes. When we say yes, He says amen, and it's a done thing. Now, this doesn't omit the timing of God. It doesn't omit the plan of God. Sometimes we have to walk through trials and tribulations. I'm not saying the blessings of God and the promises of God cancel those out. Here's a promise. You will see tribulation. As a matter of fact, through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's what Paul said in Acts 14. But what I'm saying is, God has given us great and precious promises, established a covenant based on better promises, gave them to us, and he said, just say yes. So when you're out of cash and you know that God has provision for you, what you don't do is you don't sit there and try to figure it out. What you do is you sit there and you say, for... um. I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ in heavenly places. And you know what? Jesus has provided for my every need. Every need that I have is provided out of the abundance of his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If you have sown seed and you have tithes, you say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows abundantly will also reap abundantly. Therefore, because I have sown, so shall I reap. Your promises, promises. You stand on them. You watch God's kingdom work for him, for you. <laughs> and, and this is the idea. So we come back to this verse, and it says, The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. What is this term, this concept, made herself ready, means I, I propose to you, and I don't propose, I, I'm really just telling you, you know, what, the Lord opened my eyes to this thing. We are making ourselves ready according to all that he has purchased for us. That means that as Christians partaking of a new covenant, in the approach of Jesus' return, we are to make ourselves ready by appropriating every promise that he has given us. All of the power, all of the glory that he has presented to us and made available, we are to take that, we are to get an agreement with it, we are to use it. Why? Because when he comes, we'll be finished doing that. You see, this is the thing. Prior to a wedding, a, a groom does not prepare a bride. And this is so funny. When I got married, I did not prepare my bride. I didn't. I didn't do it. Um, as a matter of fact, I, didn't, I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't even get to see her that day until her father walked her down the aisle and said, <laughs> presented her to me, presented. We'll get, we'll get to that word presented in a second. But I didn't get to see her until then. I got to see other people, you know. But she took the resources available to her, got her hair done, got her makeup done, got her dress put on, her shoes put on, all these things. Prior to the wedding, I did not prepare her. The bride prepared herself. And when she finally came out, she came out not as a raggedy, beat up, stinky, smelly bride that was really just, a, well, for lack of better terms, decrepit. Absolutely not. She was a presentation. A presentation. As a matter of fact, if you look at my wedding pictures, you may say, wow, because she was, well, uh, you know, uh, excuse the terminology, hot. Uh, she looks really good. And, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that because I was really happy that day that that was my wife. And in the same way that God looks at these things and he says, wow, look, you know, look at how I bless my kids with each other, how, you know, make their wives so beautiful and, and bless them and, and have, the, you know, this presentation. How much more do you think he wants 
to do for his own son, Jesus Christ, the very one that gave up heaven to come in this earth, manifest in a body, live a, ter a, a difficult life, and then ultimately die for no fault of his own, and uh, with no charges could be proven against him, no sins being committed. He died not for himself, but for our sins, and it was risen to life, still bearing the scars in heaven on his heavenly body of what he did for us. How much do you think he wants to bless his son when it comes to his son's marriage? I tell you, he wants to bless his son with a glorious bride that has made herself ready. And this is, in my opinion, one of the most central, most overlooked, most misunderstood concepts relating to the last days. You know what? I don't really care about um, how much the enemy wants to do that's evil and terrible and whatever. You know what? Ultimately, God is going to get his agenda done, period. The devil can't usurp that. And honestly, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, God will let this thing continue out as long as necessary for this to take place. It has to. God's not going to present his son with something that isn't prepared. So we have to prepare. That is why... I call my ministry Bride Ministries, preparing a fitting bride for the return of Jesus Christ. You know, even if I don't see that in my lifetime, I would like to get the ball rolling at least. Let somebody know. This is part of the plan. Our presentation must be glorious. Ephesians 5.27, let me sing it again. It says, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. One of the things you will find in the book of Acts, a um, very exciting book, I love the book of Acts. Why? Because it shows me what the church used to do so that I know what God plans to do more than. <laughs> uh, one of the things I love to say, the last day church is going to make the Church of Acts book like kindergarten. Why? Because what they were up against is many, many fold less than what the last day church is going to be up against. Therefore, the glory of God is going to be equivalent based on circumstances. What they had grace for is going to be um, the grace that we are going to receive for what? we are going to be coming up against is going to be many times greater. And um, therefore, you're going to see many, many greater things. So when I look at the book of Acts, how do I read it? I read it as a starting point. I say, man, if they did this, why am I not? Why am I not seeing this? And if I'm not doing it, I should have friends that are. Because that means I'm associating with people that are of the same mind, that um, <laughs> are brothers in Christ that are going to motivate me towards what Jesus really wants. Um, so we read the book of Acts and we are encouraged. In chapter 3, you'll find this passage. It says, And he sent, shall send Jesus Christ. He shall send Jesus Christ. So what is he going to do? He's going to send Jesus Christ later. Uh, and it says this, Which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Heaven must receive. You see, heaven is actually holding Jesus in. He's, it's holding Jesus from returning, from being presented to earth again in, in a, what's called a second coming, until which means that there are certain things that have to take place prior to this happening. There's a number of things. Um, a few weeks ago, I had Peter Goodgame on, and uh, he outlined for us from the Old Testament three things uh, which he believed uh, were necessary for the, uh, to, to precede the Lord's return, one of which was for God to again send the uh, spirit of Elijah to unite the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, that you know the sons would have visions and the old men would dream dreams, and this whole outpouring of of, of um, this 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 spirit and this work would be a sign of the last days. That has to happen, and, and he named two others, and um, 
I think that's absolutely accurate. I, I think that that's true. And I also think that we can glean even furthermore uh, from the New Testament things that must also take place qualifying this day where heaven is actually uh, validated to, to, to release Jesus, to stop uh, receiving him. And I believe that this is found in Ephesians 4, 11 down. This says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Um, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Sorry, I'm look, not looking at the camera for those of you that are watching me live because I got my Bible right here. Um, but it says, uh, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things which is the head even Christ. And so, what is that verse saying there? One, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I gave a teaching on this. Uh, it was part of my teaching uh, weeks and weeks ago when I was talking about church government. I was talking about church government, among other things. And I said, you know, one of the things we have to understand about church government is that church government exists because a kingdom which we are presently participating in as the children of God, we're not part of a social club, we're part of a kingdom, is a government is a government. Key things you have to understand about government. One, there is one king. Two, you don't debate with the king. The king makes edicts, and those edicts are carried out, period. That's how a kingdom works. The king is the head. The king is in charge, and the king, what the king says, go. Let me tell you something. If you've been arguing with your Bible lately, I'll tell you something. You better stop. The Bible is the word of the king. It's not up for debate. Sure, we might not understand certain aspects of it, and so we discuss these aspects amongst ourselves, trying to come to his conclusions. But there are some things that you just can't debate, period. You know what? Fornication is not up for debate. Can I just say it? I'll say it again. Fornication is not up for debate. Murder is not up for debate. It's not okay to go next door and kill your neighbor. In cold blood, murder is sin. The Bible is very clear on a lot of things, and uh, absolute truth is absolutely true. The king is in charge of his kingdom. And one of the other things you're going to see about a kingdom is that a kingdom has officers officers and offices. See, the king doesn't do everything by himself. You don't see the king cooking his own meals. You don't see the king out in a battlefield over the groups of tens and the groups of hundreds and the groups of fifties and all of the, No, the king sits on his throne and he appoints. Let's see, and when we read about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, we're talking about appointed offices within a kingdom. Now, what are these offices supposed to do? They're supposed to bring the church, perfecting the saints, or bringing the saints to full maturity for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, is this going to be necessary in the millennial reign after Jesus returns? No, it's not. You're not going to need the same offices of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher bringing the saints to full maturity. Why? We'll already be glorified. Therefore, we can with confidence, say that this passage is in reference to what God uses offices for in our age, before the return of Jesus. And what are they here to do? They're here to mature the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until. See, until means that there's an end goal, an end result that has been appointed beforehand. In other words, we're on our way there, and when we get there, we'll know that we have achieved something that we were supposed to. What are we going to do this until? See, they're here for the purpose of empowering you until the church comes in unity of the faith. 
of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let me talk about this for a minute. Um, what is the unity of the faith? You know, I was talking to a gentleman, and uh, he, he gave an amazing story. I plan to have him on the show, so I don't want to spoil it. But he gave an amazing story about the unity of the Spirit and um, how in his life, a true unity of the Spirit in one case involved him laying down everything that he had been doing for God in order to incorporate another individual that God had brought into alignment in the Spirit with his life. Um, and, and, and then with that individual having laid down everything to move forward into greater things, great sacrifice involved here. The Bible talks about two kinds of unity, unity of the Spirit and unity of the faith. Now, the unity of the Spirit is found in Ephesians chapter 4, and it says, in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. Now, at the most basal level, all Christians have unity of the Spirit. Why? We've all been baptized into one body and received one Spirit, even the Holy Spirit of God, which has become one with our Spirit according to 1 Corinthians 6.17. Now, what does that mean? That means that we are all joined together spiritually. We're one body because we have one Spirit. Now, that unity... At his most basal level, um, and, and moving up, we are to keep that in the bond of peace. We are to keep that in the bond of peace. Um, if you've been fighting with the Christians, brothers and sisters, please stop. Please repent. Please look for reconciliation or separate yourself from the issue and repent to God and move forward. This, this, this infighting amongst believers, true believers, mind you, infighting amongst true believers has to stop. The Bible commands us to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And if this means you got to shut your trap to make some progress, just shut your trap for a little while. Look, God wants to do something with us. And us is a plural word. That means more than one, more than just you. So get all your selfishness and get on board with what God's Word says. We are to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Right? So you have unity just because we are all believers. But the Bible talks about something called the unity of the faith. Now, what is that? Ephesians 4.13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Can I just say it? Simply put, the unity of the faith is when we all come to believe the same thing that God believes. Notice that I said that God believes. That means that you may not figure out what God believes by reading what someone else wrote about what they think the Bible means 50 years ago in a book of doctrine, so to speak. You see, God has a system of beliefs. It's absolute, it's perfect, and in it there's no variation or shadow of turning, nor are there any lies or contradictions because our God isn't schizophrenic. Therefore, when... We talk about coming to the unity of the faith. We don't talk about just agreeing on something just to agree with it because we should uh, just agree on something. No, we're trying to agree with God. That's the goal. And that is the movement. See, God is moving his people through those he has appointed to office into a place where we agree with God. We agree with God. And when we all come to this place where we're believing everything that God believes, we are attaining unity of the faith. We all are in unison about elements of beliefs pertaining to our faith because we believe what God believes. And so we find the absolute in the source. Now, it also talks about the knowledge of the Son of God. That's number two. It is so we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, that word knowledge is, is epignosco. What does that mean? What, what, what does it mean to come to the full, the, to, to the knowledge of the Son of God? That knowledge, epignosco, is a full knowledge. In other words, it is to fully know someone. How do you fully know a person? Let me ask you something. Have you ever been betrayed by a person? You wish you would have known them better before you got in that business deal with them or before, you know, you let them uh, watch your house for the weekend or let them babysit your kids because something really bad happened. You wish because you didn't have a full knowledge of the person, their motives and their character, uh, you, you know, you got burned. But we all not acknowledge that you could know a person but maybe not know them fully. And, and this is what the Bible is getting at here. Not that Jesus is going to do something bad to us. I'm just giving examples. The Bible says that we're come, we are to come to the knowledge of the Son of God in that we come to a full knowledge. A full knowledge. 
a full knowledge of the Son of God, a full and correct knowledge. And the only way to come to a full and correct knowledge of a person is not to know about them. I can tell you all about, you know, uh, President Gerald Ford or, you know, any of these guys in, in, in American history. And you can say, yeah, I know all about him. But did you know him? Did you have a full and correct knowledge of him? No, of course you didn't. There's no way you know the details about him that his wife did, his mother did. These things will get written into, you know, you don't know if he had bad foot odor at night, man. Or, you know, these, these, these frivolous things that, but that, that are involved in coming to a full and correct knowledge of a person. See, and when we talk about this in light of this passage and what the appointed officers are there to do, they are to help the church come to, they're to help you come to a full and correct knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, usher you into such a deep place of intimacy and relationship with Jesus Christ that you begin to get a full and correct knowledge of him person to person. Heart to heart. Spirit to spirit. See, it, that leaders stop teaching the people about God and leaders start teaching people to engage God. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about teaching people to engage God. How do you do that? You break down the barriers. You tell people you don't have to be afraid of God. You don't have to think that God won't accept you. The Bible says you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ because of Him having nothing to do with you. Therefore, you need to enter into His grace. You need to enter into His throne. You need to come to His feet and know that He's going to accept you there. It doesn't matter if you have to repent to get there, if you have sin on your life. You know what? Get rid of it before His feet. He accepts you. God wants people to come to the full and correct knowledge of Him. That doesn't just mean that He wants relationship with you um, uh, 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 carnally. He, he wants to immerse Himself in you. As a matter of fact, it comes to the point where Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That that full and correct knowledge of Jesus went to the extent that He trusted Jesus so much, He let Him take over. And that is the goal. Now, we're also to come to a perfect man. What does that mean? That means fully mature. The Bible talks about four stages of growth in um, the, the book of 1 John. I love the book of John because uh, John had such a deep relationship with Jesus that, that he writes a prob possibly the most mature apostle writing in the New Testament. Now, um, you know, that that's just my opinion. I'm not saying that he necessarily was, but he seemed to know Jesus in such a way that with the most simplest truths, he just wrote them in a way that just blow your mind. And as you read through the book of 1 John, his gospel, it's this layer upon layer upon layer of revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. But, you know, as, as, um, as he's writing, uh, in, in chapter 2, he says this, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him from that is from the beginning. And I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Now, what is this saying here? In this passage, the word fathers is the same. Uh, the word used for young men is the same. But when he refers to little children, he, he does it twice. And um, those are two different words. Each time the King James translates little children, one refers to little, little baby, like babies, toddlers. And another refers to like elementary school age children. In other words, he talks about stages of growth. He talks about stages of growth. As, as we are born into the kingdom of God, we're kind of born like babies. In other words, we need to grow up in Christ. And as we go through trials, tribulations, circumstances, situations where we choose Jesus instead of ourselves, instead of the world, as we pass the tests, tests God will test you as he matures you, as you pass. You move into greater and greater maturity, greater and greater responsibility, greater and greater authority. Uh, greater and greater position. Um, God does not appoint babies to apostleship, does not appoint babies to the office of the prophet. You have to grow. 
into these things. Just like, just like in a real army, in a real kingdom, it's always grown men that are appointed into position of holding office. It's always grown men. And so what we're talking about here is that the work of the leaders in the body of Christ is to move the church into a place of maturity. Maturity. Full maturity. And then it goes on and says, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which is just about as mind-blowing as the church becoming a glorious presentation. In other words, um, where the church begins to have difficulty being discerned from the God of the church. It, they <laughs> kind of look the same. Very similar. You know, to be Christian means to be Christ-like. <laughs> God wants people that are Christ-like. And so, and so he wants us to grow into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And as we do this, right, watch this. We're no longer tossed like children. Why? We're not children anymore. Uh, no longer tossed to and flow, carried about by every wind of doctrine. Why? We now believe what God believes. And when you know what God believes, there is a firm foundation in that, that, that really, it's very hard to be shaken. Once you know the truth, it's hard to begin believing a lie. It's hard. That's a hard thing to do, to come off the truth to say, you know what, ah, that, that's cool. I don't need the truth anymore. I'd rather have this terrible lie. I mean, it's, it's just hard. Now, it's, sometimes it's hard to come out of a lie and into the truth, but to come out of the truth and into a lie, that is a difficult thing. And so it's hard to be carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, by cutting craftiness, whereby they lie in way to deceive and so we understand this thing. Now, here's a question. All right, Daniel, you're talking, you're preaching. Uh, this is kind of exciting, but I have a problem here. I believe in the doctrine of imminence. The doctrine of imminence tells me that Jesus can come at any time at all. Right now. As of now. I understand it to mean that the doctrine of imminence says that he can come anytime. So that means that everything that you're telling me, you know what, it sounds cool, it's great and all, but you know what, I don't believe it. I'm not going to buy in. Because you know what, I think that uh, God wants to spare me from the wrath that's to come. And, and uh, you know, that's a, that's a real hard thing to come off of, sir. Uh, and, and you know what, I have uh, several theologians that have thrown this word out to me, doctrine of imminence. And, and you know what, I want to believe it. You know what, here's, here's the thing. Let me let me say this about the doctrine of imminence. It's largely based on uh, two verses in my understanding. And I, what I want to do is I want to go through these two verses. And um, after we're done, uh, probably move to a break. But I want to go through these two verses here because it clears up quite a bit on this issue. Matthew twenty five thirteen says this. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. In another one of the Gospels it says, neither the angels nor the Son, but only the Father knows. So no one knows except for the Father. And, and um, we don't know the day or the hour. That's pretty clear. When someone says, Jesus is coming on November, uh, whatever, at 2200 hours and um, 30 minutes, because I said so, we, we, we kind of know that they're, they're wrong. And we always go to this verse and say, this is why we know they're wrong. And, and we, you know what, as soon as you said that, I already knew that's not when Jesus is coming back. But this is a key verse. How, how do you overcome that, Daniel? How do you reconcile that with everything you've just said? <clears throat> Furthermore, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That's pretty clear, isn't it? The Lord's coming as a thief in the night. Therefore, we're really not going to know when he comes, because you never know when the thief is going to come. So how are you going to know when Jesus is going to come? So since we don't know the day or the hour, and he's coming as a thief, we must believe that God can come at any time at all right now. No, we don't. Um, we do resolve this. And we resolve this with logic. We resolve this with truth. As a matter of fact, um, when Jesus says, we will not know the day or the hour, <coughs> he is actually employing a Hebrew idiom, a 
affiliated with the Feast of Trumpets. What does that mean? The Feast of Trumpets occurs over a two-day, 48-hour period, during which no man knows the day or the hour, right? So, in, in their month, and, and, and what is the Feast of Trumpets? First of all, the Feast of Trumpets is a Hebrew feast. There's seven of them. Um, I did a show a while back with an excellent gentleman. Uh, we called it the uh, Discussing the Hebrew Feast and the Red Heifer Ceremony, I believe. And uh, we went through all of the Hebrew feasts uh, for both what the, the, the Hebrews believe about them, the Jewish people, and also for what he believed uh, they spoke to regarding our faith and um, the, the, the Christian perspective, because they serve as types and shadows. And uh, the, the, the thing is, the Feast of Trumpets itself actually does occur over a two-day, a two 48-hour period. You can look this up. Um, how is it distinguished then? That, see, the thing is, with the uh, Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour are distinguished by the appearing of a new moon. Now, this new moon appears 29 and a half days after the last one. What does this mean? This means it can occur on the 29th or the 30th of that month, the month in which this, this feast occurs. This feast is the fifth feast of the Hebrew year. There are three uh, feasts in the spring, one feast in the summer, that one is the Feast of Pentecost, and, um, and then you have three feasts in the fall, which is kicked off by the Feast of Trumpets. And then you have um, the Day of the Atonement, and finally you, you uh, move into the um, Feast of Tabernacles. But on this feast, this is going to occur on either the 29th or 30th day of that fall month. <clears throat> that is not any time at all right now. That Hebrew idiom employed by Jesus has nothing to do with giving us the idea that he will come at any time at all right now. No, no, no. He said very specifically that there is a pointed time frame, an appointed parameter on this event. It's really a 48-hour parameter in its biblical use. Now, am I saying that we'll know what um, the 48-hour parameter will be? Well, if, if you know about what I believe, um, <clears throat> I believe that this is possible as we get closer to the day, because... I don't believe we're looking for th a, a twofold return of Jesus. I happen to believe that um, Jesus comes w once, all at once, and everything kind of happens as part of one big event. But I'm not getting into that aspect in this show. Maybe in future shows I will uh, take those that are listening through this verse by verse and those that are you know, going to hear this on podcast and blog talk and um, on the YouTube and all so, so forth. But, but – um, the idea is that we want to take away here is that there are parameters, but in no sense of the word use in the fact that he used this idiom, does he intend to communicate that he can come at any time at all right now? No, he says you'll know the parameters, and it's going to be fairly specific, but it won't quite be the day or the hour. Now, how do we resolve the thief issue? When Paul reminds the believers in Thessalonica that the return of the Lord would be as a thief in the night, he actually clarifies this thought in his same breath. He says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. But then in verse 4 he says this, But ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you. That that day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, for those that are watching, it won't come as a surprise. Now, we use that to say that we're in the season of the Lord's return, but you know what? What I've just explained to you is every reason why you need to understand that what I'm telling you about what God wants to do in his bride, bride is relevant to your life right now. As the body of believers, we need to get beyond this idea that we are going to be taken in any shape we happen to be in. No. God is going to move us into maturity. And I don't care. Even if he has to do it with one believer left standing, he's going to do it. But the idea is 
he's going to do it, and he's going to do it for the whole body of believers that is on earth presently at that time. And um, we need to have that in our sights as we move into the last day. This is Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. We will be back soon. Hit Christian Broadcasting Station, C-U-B-N. Sometimes I think, what will people say of me, when I'm only just a memory, when I'm home where my soul belongs, was I loved? No one else would show up Was I Jesus to the least of us? Was my worship more than just a song? back on Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall, and we are in our second segment. We just came off of our first segment, talking about a lot of exciting things, things that are close to my heart, things pertaining to the Bride of Christ, and how God wants to prepare us to be that bride for His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is a work that He intends to do with 
the whole church, not just with one or two believers, meaning that if you are a Christian, you truly believe in Jesus, and you're listening to me, I'm talking to you. Now, one of the things, as we resume our discussion, that I haven't touched on yet, is spots. Spots, spots, spots. These are always fun. Spots are always a problem. If you are like me, you hit uh, your teenage years, hit puberty, and got acne. Spots. Spots came, and they were not fun. You had to squeeze them, and they had all kinds of nastiness on the inside. You had to get them out of your face. I had to get them out of mine. Um, spots always are undesirable. They're undesirable. They are uh, blemishes. They cause the appearance of a thing to be diminished. Spots are not a desirable in God's sight, not your acne necessarily, that's a flesh thing, but God illustrated this when he had the, 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 the Israelites make sacrifices, and they would sacrifice the lamb. And when they would bring their, uh, their, their animal to the priest, they would have to bring one without blemish, and Jesus became the lamb that was slain, the lamb without blemish. The red heifer always had to be sacrificed. It was one without any blemish. All sacrifices had to be without blemish and, uh, and spot. And so the thing is, God is always looking for that, 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 that sacrifice, that living sacrifice without spots. And um, he carries this right over to the kind of church that he wants to present to his son, Jesus Christ. He says in Ephesians 5.27, coming back to this verse, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. What are spots? What are spots? Spots. The thing about spots is that this, this is a challenging concept because it forces us to accept something. It, it, it forces us really, to accept the reality of, of the false prophets, that they exist, that they're real, false teachers, um, and that their origins are with us. In other words, they don't necessarily begin that way. Second Peter 2, verse, chapter 2, verses 1 and 10 say this. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as thou shalt be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Okay, so there we have it. False prophets among the people, false teachers among you. And they bring in these uh, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord Jesus that brought them, bought them. Jesus actually bought these people. And then they says, and they bring upon themselves swift destruction. That was Second Peter verse chapter 2, verse 1. Now, if we read down to verse 10, it continues and says, And they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are. And blemishes. So the Bible right here, in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, and then down to verse 10, it tells us exactly what the spots are. There's really no need for debate. You know, the, the thing about the Bible that I learned, um, that ended the debate for me, was this, this, this fact. The Bible says that God will never leave or forsake us, but it never says that we cannot leave or forsake Him. It's not easy, and just like getting saved requires a quality heart, a quality subconscious decision in favor of Christ, walking away requires the same purposeful, express desire to depart from him. It's not simple sin that divides us and causes us to, quote-unquote, lose salvation. No. You have to, it, a person to do this actually has to forsake it. But the Bible says that, you know, there are these false prophets, false teachers, and it calls them spots. And it says that Jesus that bought them was denied. 
Now, it goes on in Jude 12, picks up, talking about spots, saying, these are spots in your Feast of Charity. Spots in your Feast of Charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. How do you have something that is twice dead? The idea is that they were dead, born dead as dead spirits. Our human spirits are born dead because Adam is the father of the human race, and when he sinned, death entered. When we get saved, Jesus Christ enters and gives us new life in him, puts the breath of life on our spirit, joins us to the spirit of God, and we are living spirits at that point with Jesus. The difference is that once we are living, then we can apparently die again because the only way to be twice dead is to be dead live and then die again and it is exactly what it says in jude 12 of those that are spots and so we find this concept of apostate believers um and without going any further with that i just want to say the bible describes what the spots are they have to exit the church they're going to have to exit and um God is then going to cause those that are truly committed to him to be that bride, to be that group that becomes the glorious presentation to Jesus Christ. Just like the way when we get married, we as men want a glorious presentation of our wives. Jesus Christ wants a glorious presentation of his church. Now, the return of Christ is full of wedding themes. We are not even touching on the, like, you know, um, elements found in the book of Ruth, for instance, that God is our kinsman redeemer. Um, you know, but what, what what we're talking about here is that a bride must prepare to be presented to her husband at their wedding. And the bride of Christ is the church corporately. Now, this involves us fulfilling Ephesians 4.13. Now, if you're wondering why my vision is to promote unity in the body of Christ and assist in the creation and development of sheep nations. That first half to promote unity is because I understand that the plan of God for the last days cannot be done on the backs of just one or two men of God. No. God is not looking for an Elijah in a company of Israel in the last days. He's looking for a company of believers, a corporate manifestation of maturity and his Glory, the greatest work of God ever revealed next to Jesus Christ, I believe, will be the work that occurs in the church that meets him. Because it's so impossible. But what is with possible with man is possible with God. So I have to believe that if the word says it, God has a strategy to bring it about to make it possible. And I am fully committed to being part of it. If all that means right now is just for me to tell you about it, to give you something to think about and believe in, to put your faith in, the Word of God. Now, unveiling the power. I want to take us a step beyond this idea. Um, almost just walking you right through my vision. Why do you believe what you do, Daniel? Why do you say to promote unity in the body of Christ and assist in the creation and development of sheep nations? First of all, what the heck is a sheep nation? Um, and how do you develop one of those? Now, let me just give a little bit of clarity from the Word of God so we have a, a foundation to go back to. And this is exciting. It's a ton of revelatory material. And I'll tell you what, I can't wait to tell you about it. The Bible says in Matthew 25 that when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now that's Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 33. Here is the, the context of the passage. The passage begins in a certain specific time frame. In other words, everything that follows, because this goes all the way through Matthew 25, verse 45, everything that follows from verse 31 to 45 is based on the same time frame. Now, you can apply elements of it to uh, different aspects of this life right now and what we're doing and so forth. Um, 
and still be doing okay. But, but what I want you to understand is the context of this passage to understand the full interpretation intent by, intended by Jesus for those that will read it and would hear it. He's talking about his return in glory. Not just about his return as in second coming, but he's going a step beyond that because he says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and his holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. So, The thing is, God actually in this passage has moved beyond his return and right into the sitting upon his throne. When does that happen? This happens after Armageddon. You see, um, this comes out pretty clearly in Isaiah chapter 24, which is why I'm flipping to it right now. And I'm going to just point it out. In Isaiah 24, you see um, some things going on says, fear in the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. One of the things that happens during the fifth trumpet of the book of Revelation is that the pit opens up, which I believe really in, it speaks to a dimensional portal. But out of this open pit, realm of the pit, come these hybridized creatures, with, uh, that w- which is a plague unto those in the earth that have not the... Uh, the, the, the well, the mark of the Lord upon them. And, and uh, you know, it says, goes on, and it says, And shall come to the pass, that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall in the pit, and he that comes out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. The windows of heaven from on high are open. The foundations of the earth do shake. And then it goes on, it says, The earth is utterly broken down. Clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. Get this imagery in your mind. The warfare, I, I believe, in the last days, um, that, that occurs in the spirit realm will cause the earth to shake itself. When you saw those speaking, in, <laughs> as I'm saying this, the presence of the Lord is all over me. I hope you can feel it. When the people pray in the book of Acts, they feel the earth shake. It's an earthquake. It's an earthquake as they pray. And it's so exceptionally revelatory to them. That they, they say, wow, look, we're praying and the earth is shaking. We read that now. And we're so jealous. We say, why doesn't the earth shake in my prayer meetings? But when you look at the last days, the spiritual warfare, I believe the earth itself, not just a location, the whole thing. It's the whole thing. It's like the whole thing's coming down. It's so much power. But... It goes on, and it says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. There's the punishment of the return of Jesus Christ. And it says they're going to be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. You know, there's going to be a lot of fallen angels and other uh, beings that are associated with the wickedness of the Antichrist kingdom in the last days. It's not just Lucifer that's locked in the pit. It's also all of these guys, according to Isaiah chapter 24, verse 22. And then it says, And the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. Right there, you have the Lord ruling in Mount Zion, and that's what I'm talking about. When I come back to Matthew 25, verse 31, we've just picked up right there. It's afterwards. And God says, Now that he's seated upon the throne of his glory, we're in Zion. Before him are going to be gathered all nations. What does that mean? That means that at that time, nations are going to have to exist to be judged by him. Now, this is Revelation. Nations are going to have to exist at that time to be judged by him, and he has to separate them. Why? Because the earth is now about to move into transition. We're transitioning out of the age that was and into the millennial reign. So we have Matthew 25, verse 31 through, 30, to, through 45 to kind of explain this process. This sets, this sets the, uh, the, 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 so to speak, time frame for everything that follows. Sheep and goat nations are determined as such by Jesus after his return. Um, where else can we get some evidence of what I was saying? 
What else speaks to this? In the book of Daniel, chapter 11, beginning in verse uh, 31, it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall pollute the abomination, uh, place of abomination that makes desolate. One of the things that Jesus says in Matthew 24, that when you see the abomination of desolation put in the holy place, flee. And we understand uh, by cross-referencing Scripture that this basically defines the last 42 months of the Antichrist rule. The thing is, as we move down, we see a lot of war going on. And, and the war continues all the way up until chapter 12. There's a lot of warfare. It says in verse 40, which happens after verse 31, that the king of the south shall push at him, meaning the Antichrist, and the king of the north shall push at him like a whirlwind. This is conflict. Now, understand, one of the things we talk about is the idea that anyone wants to put in an Antichrist that's going to sit at the head of a one-world government. There's no doubt that there is a plan to put in a one-world government. The plan is how. The question is how successful is this really going to be in light of everything that Bible prophecy has to say. The idea is that even in a time period characterized as the Great Tribulation, um, which the rest of Daniel chapter 11 speaks to, it speaks to one um, elements of Antiochus Epiphanes in the latter days in years of his kingdom and what he did, but not all of it because not all of it was fulfilled by him. So we also know that the rest of it in addition to the whole, is intended to be fulfilled by a future character we define as the Antichrist, according to um, his title given to us in First John. Um, you know that there are already ma and many Antichrists, but there is an Antichrist that is to come. And we see that there is conflict, and that, not just uh, isolated conflict. This is international conflict. Why? It doesn't seem as though in light of the attempt to put in, and this is, this, is, this is a different way of looking at things, I understand, but it doesn't look to me from what the Bible is saying in chapter 40, verse uh, 41, um, everyone ends up part of this thing. It seems like there's conflict all the way to the end. And he's trying and trying to fulfill build this one world government and take over the whole world, but somehow resistance keeps coming up. And this is why we're, we talk about sheep and goat nations. What were they doing? Why, why are they there after Jesus has already ended the battle of Armageddon? Well, we begin to understand this. Um, more about the judgment. I want, I want to talk a little bit more about this, this context. What is this called? We see the battle of Armageddon has happened, and now Jesus reigns out of Zion, and then all nations are gathered to him. Um, what is this called? This is called the judgment seat of Christ. Now, there's two judgments. There's the judgment seat of Christ, and there's the great white throne judgment. They're actually separate. 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 Why are they separate? Um, the judgment seat of Christ deals with the rewards of the saints and this. The Great White Throne Judgment is at the end of what's called the millennium or millennial period, 1,000 years after the Battle of Armageddon, during which uh, Jesus is ruling in his millennial rule. And the judgment seat of Christ is defined by two verses, um, largely. Romans 14.10, it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we, the saints, shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There it is. So, the saints shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he has done, whether good or bad. So we're talking about reward here. We're not talking about a judgment for salvation. We're talking about a judgment based on the justice of God, the justice of a God who watches the lives that you and I live, and determines the degree to which we have cooperated with his plans for us, and then rewards us justly. 
and then rewards us justly. There is going to be a vast difference in reward for the person that has forsaken everything they have to follow Jesus and the person that received Jesus as their Lord and Savior only to pursue their own vain imaginations, sit in a church, and act like they knew something throughout their lives. There is a very big difference, and God understands that. And the foundation of His throne is righteousness and justice, and I tell you, He takes that into account, and there is a day of reckoning where God is going to judge His people based on that they have done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 now, this all happens at the judgment seat of Christ. This happens prior to the, uh, the true inception of what's called a millennial rule. It's part of the transition from this age and into that. Um, and, 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 and the thing we have to understand is that <clears throat> um, this passage, which talks about sheep nations, is really on the tail end of what's happening. Another, another thing we have to understand is that all, all Christians must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All Christians must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I understand that there have been some teachers of the Word of God that have said that the judgment seat of Christ is going to happen in heaven during a period of time called the tribulation. There have been some that have said that. Um, I'm not attacking the uh, pre-trib perspective today, but I have this issue with that idea. If you say that there are going to be Christians that get saved during the Great Tribulation period, and the judgment seat of Christ happens in heaven for those Christians that were already saved when Jesus came and snuck them out, um, how then or where then do those Christians that get saved during the quote-unquote Great Tribulation get judged? That there's a problem. You would have to then have a second judgment seat of Christ to take care of them because they have still not finished what they were doing on earth to be judged by um, while the other saints are getting judged in heaven. It's, it's so what I say is, listen, we see Jesus seated on his throne. In Zion, at the end of this whole thing, after Armageddon, why don't we just believe that that is the location of the judgment seat of Christ, and that all Christians that have lived prior to that, living or dead, raptured or, or changed, whatever have you, um, they're all getting judged at the same time in the same place. And this is, I believe, exactly what happens. And at this judgment seat, you find an exceptional exposition of how it works in the book of Matthew, right before Jesus tells us about sheep nations. Right before it. It happens in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 12. What does it say? What does it say, Matthew 25, verse 12? It talks about the parable of the talents. I'm not going to read this whole parable to you. Um, I'm just going to look at some key elements, bring them out. The thing is, we set the tone for what we're experiencing. We're experiencing the judgment seat of Christ. And what God is doing here is he's pictured as giving different talents out to different servants. One gets one, one gets two, one gets uh, uh, five. And then they go forth and, and they do what they're going to do with their talents. One multiplies it to ten, one multiplies it to four, and the other one, well, they just bury it. They bury their talent. They don't do anything with it. And what God does is he gives reward at the end. He, he comes back and he then judges his servants. And they're all servants, first of all, all of them. <clears throat> he judges them. He says, the one that I gave you five, now you give me five more besides these. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful with a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Ruler over what? What are they going to rule? This is rulership in the millennium. In other words, they have reward in that age for what was done in this one. For, it's the same thing with the one that multiplied two. They, they were given less. They had a lower yield, but it was the same multiplication factor. And so you see the justice of God there in that they get the same reward in the end. And he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And then he gets to the last one who says, hey, I, I buried my stuff. Here it is. You can have it back. He says, 
thou wicked and slothful servant. Then what he does is he takes what he has, gives it the one to the one who has ten talents, and he says this. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's a judgment there. Now, there's a judgment there. Uh, what is the outer darkness? I'm not going to touch on the outer darkness today. Um, I actually have a teaching on my website that you can go to where I talk about this issue. Um... What I want to establish is that what you just saw is a picture. You saw a picture of the first half, so to speak, of the judgment seat of Christ. And then we're in the same time frame here where we see the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Then he sits on the throne of his glory, right? And before him are gathered all nations. So now we have all nations here. And then we see this. The sheep are being divided from the goats. And um, we have to accept what it says at face value. Because when we understand the context, then we can really begin to understand what the passage says. And so when we read beyond verse 33, it says, He's just set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. Verse 34 says, Then the king shall say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry? Fed thee, or thirsty, and we gave you a drink. When did we see you a stranger and took you in naked and you clothed thee? Or when did we see you sick and in prison and came to thee? And the king shall say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now let me stop there and say this. Most times what I see Christians do is take this verse right here. As you have done to the least of these, my brethren. Start a mission society, put a sick African child on a picture, and say we're going out to the least of these. But can I tell you something? They missed the whole context of the whole passage. Setting this at the judgment seat of Christ, really, truly, what they're getting at is, um, we're talking about the brethren of God that have just been judged. How do we know? How do we know that when God says, the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me? It's because the Bible defines Christians as the brethren of God. The Bible says in John 20, verse 17, Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren. He was talking about his followers, his apostles, those that believed on him. And say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, unto my God, and your God. Why are we Jesus' brothers? Because we have the same Father. And when he says, unto the least of these, my brethren, he's talking about a group of saints there that have already been judged. When he says, to the least of these, he's saying, from the least all the way unto the greatest. In other words, he says, even to the least. And... You know, where else do we find out that we are the brethren of the Lord? 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. That's, that's that we are the family of God. We are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. Co-laborers with Him. We, we are all part of the same family. And so, so, so we're talking about being His brethren. As you've done to the least. So he's talking to a group that interacted with Christians. That's what he's doing here. And he's saying, well, I'm calling you righteous, one, and you're entering into the kingdom, two. Why would God allow a person entrance into the kingdom that was not judged as a saint? And that's the key here. This is all about a transition. What are sheep nations? Sheep nations are nations people groups, and that's the word ethnos, ethnos, Greek. It means people group and or political geographies. It can mean either or. There's no distinction that we can accurately draw on this side of the event looking forward. We just have to take it for what it is. People groups and or geographic political territories. What they have done, in essence, is cooperate and be influenced by 
the brethren of the Lord. And when the Lord comes on the other side of Armageddon, he takes them to his throne, judges them, and he says, because you were influenced by and you helped my body, my brethren, which were in the earth, now I am allowing you. I am allowing you entrance into my millennial reign. So in other words, what the sheep nations are, are people groups, people um, within specific political geographies and so forth. At that time, that although they are not counted saints at the return of Jesus Christ, by their works to the saints. In other words, God looks at their works, really, really truly looks at their works. They are granted entrance into the kingdom which is manifesting as the millennial reign of Jesus Christ for this reason. They never died. You see, in the new covenant, we don't go to hell until we die. That's when God sends a person that has not believed in him to hell. But what the Bible is suggesting here is that nations, there are people groups that will survive the return of Jesus Christ, and as a result, they must be judged. And as they are judged, as they are judged, they're divided between sheep and goats. Some are coming in and others are going out. And the determining factor, according to the word of God, is did you see me naked and clothe me? Did you see me sick and visit me? How did you treat my people? Because you're not dead yet, and since you haven't died yet, I'm transitioning one age into the next, and I am allowing these groups, those judged as sheep nations, entrance as humans into the millennial reign. It took me a long time. It took me a long time to understand this because I had to overcome so many objections. I had to overcome so many objections. And I'm going to go through some of these objections with you because I'm sure you have the same objections. Um, ob objection one. Doesn't the whole world submit to the Antichrist? You see, we're going through a, a, a horrible time where the Antichrist, Antichrist will manifest. What, what will this Antichrist look like? I believe, along with Doug Riggs and others, that this will be some kind of uh, uh, Nephilim hybrid uh, having the throne of Satan given to him by Satan himself, um, coming with all power, signs, and lying wonders. He's going to be manifesting as a superhuman God-man, and um, he's going to be quite a potent fellow. Now, doesn't the whole world submit to that? Because Revelation 13, 8 does say, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose name are not written in the book of the life of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So doesn't that say that if you're not Christian, you're going to worship the beast? Because your name is not written in the book of life if you're not saved. And here's the answer. The answer is, not necessarily. Psalm 139, verse 15 through 16, really helps us to understand how the book of life works. In other words, as the Bible defines it, the book of life doesn't have your name written into it when you're saved. First of all, the book of life existed before salvation in Jesus Christ. You find references to it in the Old Testament. So, what constitutes a person's name being written in the book of life? Well, the answer is, in Psalm 139, it says that when the Lord, and, and, and I'm going to go there, and I'm just going to read it, but the idea is that when the Lord joins our spirits to our uh, body, in our mother's womb, at conception, all of our members are written in his book. In other words, he documents the event in his book. What book? The book of life. In other words, when a person is born, when a person is birthed into life as a human being, note the word human being, they are inscribed in God's book. Now, what does this mean? This means that every person that is human that lives and is born is actually written, which is why whenever you look at a reference to the book of life, whether it's Old Testament or New, what you're really looking at is a petition to either not, to, to, to not be blotted out, um, to, and in the book of life, it's, it, it's always talking about people being blotted out in the book of Revelation. If anyone should change any of the words of this book, you know, God's going to take away his part out of the book of life. Um, when he's talking to the church, he says, I will not blot your name 
from the book of life. Um, what, what we're talking about here is being removed, not so much people being inserted. Bible says in Psalm 139, verse 15, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So, when we begin to understand that the book of life, we're actually, see, the Bible says that the sacrifice of Jesus was sufficient for the whole world. He's actually the, 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 the God that takes away the sins of the whole world. It is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. God acknowledges that every human ultimately would have a place in his kingdom if only they would believe in him. There is it, it, no such thing as... Um, and I forget the exact term, but basically uh, that, that Jesus' sacrifice is only sufficient for a certain number of people. It's not the will of God that any should perish. That's what the Bible says. The, the sacrifice of Jesus is sufficient to save the whole world. And that, 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 um, that, that our name written in the book of life, acknowledging us as being born as human into the world, that gives us the permission. So when we understand that, and we look at, a population that is not written in the book of life. What we're looking at is a non-human population. In other words, the Bible prophesies of the Antichrist kingdom that it is going to be largely populated by non-human entities. Where is transhumanism leading to post-humanism, to interfacing with machines, the fallen angels that are going to manifest at that time, Nephilim agenda, where are all these coming to? We're talking about creating a population that is not human. And all that dwell upon the earth, whose names are not written in the book of life. In other words, who are not human, yet existing on earth at that time of the Antichrist kingdom, will worship the Antichrist. In other words, it leaves room for the idea that people, 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 humans that are alive at that time, um, may not worship the Antichrist, even though... Uh, 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 they haven't submitted to Jesus Christ. And, and so, this clears up a lot. Doesn't the whole world submit to the Antichrist? Not necessarily. Not based on that verse and its counterpart in Revelation chapter 17. Furthermore, we read, as I pointed out in the beginning, there's wars during the entire Antichrist rule. Daniel 11, 31 to 45. We see them happening. There is resistance. We can't discount that. We have to fit that into our understanding of what the last days reveal. It says Edom and Moab are going to escape out of his hand in Daniel chapter 11. They're going to escape. In other words, they don't want to be in his hand. They're getting out. Um, what are we talking about? We're talking about human populations that are in resistance, in opposition to what the Antichrist is attempting to do on the earth. So when we get to this transition, we have people groups. We have people groups that need to be judged. Okay. Let's talk about this. What about salvation in Jesus Christ, Daniel? I thought that the only way to get into heaven was to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is true. As I said, we're talking about transition. When we get into sheep nations, we're talking about Jesus is already back. Therefore, all the rules are changing. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, and Micah 4, verse 2, they actually say like the same thing. I don't know if maybe one just copied off the other or whatever, but you know what? The Bible says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses shall all things be established. And these two verses say the exact same thing about the millennial rule. It says this, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of of the God of Japheth, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In other words, in the millennium, the rules change. And in transitioning to the millennium, we're no longer looking at, are we saved or not, heaven or hell? We're looking at works because the people never died. And that's the key. And they're being moved into a situation defined by Isaiah 2, 3, and Micah 4, 2. Now, what is the law that goes forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem? What does that mean? I'm not quite sure exactly all the specifics on this verse, but what I do know is that the rules change. The rules change, and we're in transition. Um, now, 
Let's answer this question. There's a verse in Revelation chapter 20. Um, it, it's actually uh, a situation. What you see is that God gives judgment to the saints. And, and um, then Satan is locked in the pit. And you see that the millennial rule has its inception and, and goes forth. Now, it says, starting in verse 8 at that time, that at the end of the millennial reign, the devil is going to go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they go up on the breadth of the earth and compass the camp of the saints round about of the beloved city. What happens? Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. What are we looking at there? Why are people at war with God at the end of the millennial reign? What, how does that make any sense? See, many people have believed this. Many people have believed that in the millennium there's only Christians. But then they get to chapter 20 in Revelation, they say, I don't know. I don't know. Because what we don't want to believe is that maybe we could be that person that believed in Jesus on this side of the millennium, got to the end and decided to rebel. And although we receive Jesus, we still end up in the lake of fire when everything's said and done. We don't want to believe that. But if Christians are the only people living in the millennium, who are these nations that get deceived? But the good news is the sheep nation concept clears the whole thing up. Why? God allows sheep nations into the millennial reign based on their interactions with his body of believers on earth prior to his return. Now, those people enter the millennium as people. They don't get redeemed bodies. They don't get glorification. They don't get perfection. What they get is the inheritance of the kingdom of the ability to live in that millennium as citizens. Now, now things begin to make sense. Because guess what? If Bill and Sue were married and somehow managed to survive the return of Jesus and got judged as sheep nations because while they didn't believe in Jesus necessarily, they didn't oppose the people of God on the earth at that time. You know what? God will allow them entrance into the kingdom and call them righteous. And you know what? When God calls you righteous, you are righteous. That, that's it. But they are still citizens and they are still people. And when they go in, they're going to have the same reproductive capacities that they did in this age. Oh. So now you have a situation where you have saints, those that were redeemed out of the earth by believing in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and you're going to have citizens, those that were judged as sheep nations, not cast out as goat nations, yet being alive, but those that were judged as sheep nations, living on earth at the same time. Now, as those people begin to put their seed into the earth, their progeny, what begins to happen? The earth sees a re population. In other words, when we read the book of Revelation, we learn this. A lot of people die. A lot of people will die. There's no question about that. But what we learn is that the earth is going to be repopulated because when we get to Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, it says he's going to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth and their number is as the sand of the sea. Where do they come from? Well, if you have people reproducing for a thousand years under the circumstances of the earth present in the millennium, you're going to have a lot of people. And many of these people that are born will never have known the evil of the devil. They'll never have known him. They'll be born into a world that is defined and characterized by the kingship of Jesus Christ, the overlordship of his saints, and the, 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 the atmosphere of peace. And when the devil goes forth, he is going to be a force they have not known, and he is still a deceiver, he is still a liar, and they're going to bite the bait, and there are going to be nations that go against God under the lies of the devil and are devoured. But this will not be the saints. But this answers the question, why are the nations there here? That's why. 
So we understand that Sheep Nation actually makes all the sense in the world. It answers questions that could never be answered before this element was placed into our understanding of God's plan for the last days. It actually, it was information that for many was not present. But now that I have given it to you, now I hope that many questions are answered. And furthermore, it clarifies other verses. Oh my gosh, here's another one. In verse uh, 16 of Zechariah 14, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In the millennium, guess what? The Feast of Tabernacles is going to be kept continually. Furthermore, it says everyone that is left of all nations which came up against Jerusalem. That means that there were nations that came up against Jerusalem. There were members of these people groups, of these political boundaries, but they survived. Somehow, on the other side of the millennium, these people are still there worshiping the king. How did they get there? They were granted entrance as sheep nations, because of their interaction with the saints. When we were hungry, they gave us meat. When we were thirsty, they gave us drink. It's exactly what the Bible says for the reasons the Bible states. That's why sheep nations exist. So now we know why there's nations there coming up, which formerly came up against Jerusalem in Zechariah chapter 14. Because in verse 2 it says, God brought all nations to Jerusalem. It doesn't say that he brought every member of all nations. It just says that all nations have a presence there. Now, um, what about Revelation chapter 11, verse 18? Here's some more understanding. And the nations were angry that thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them which fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And we see four groups there. One, prophets. Two, saints. Three, them which fear thy name. And four, those which destroy the earth. Now, how do we break this down? Prophets. Those pertain to, to those that were redeemed out of the Old Testament. Saints, those which were redeemed out of the New Covenant or the New Testament. Them which fear thy name. Who knows? And then we have those which destroy the earth. That's pretty clear. So when we deal with Old Testament saints, those that were redeemed out of the Old Testament, um, and, and, and then we have New Testament saints, what about this third group? Them which fear thy name. How do we understand them? What kind of group do we group those people with? Good question, until you run into sheep nations. And then you have another answer answered. See, those which fear the name of the Lord are those which were cooperative with the people of God. And so when we were hungry, they gave us meat. When we were thirsty, they gave us drink. It's the same thing. It just comes right back around. And because they are those which fear thy name, guess what? They uh, get a reward. Their reward is citizenship in the millennial rule. So it all comes together. We see this just piecing itself together all over the Word of God, Old Testament to the New. Now, the Bible is clear. Furthermore, again, Matthew twenty two thirty, the saints will be as the angels of God in heaven, not being married nor given in marriage. Without being in marriage and a marriage covenant, how will God honor your kids? He won't. As a matter of fact, when you're given your glorified body, you won't be having kids. So how are people going to be repopulating the earth if it's only the saints in the millennium? Because the people repopulating were not saints. They're those judged as sheep nations. The return of Christ is more about transition than total total destruction. Um, there is so much about the return of Christ that has been misunderstood, uh, mis misconceived, um, so many pieces have not been applied, and we kind of, with a broad brushstroke, just painted a doom and gloom, escape route mentality upon ourselves without giving time to look at some of the finer details of what's available. And what I'm trying to give you is some finer details here. See, but what does this mean when you say, Daniel, it is... The vision of bride ministries to promote unity in the body of Christ and assist in the creation and development of sheep nations. 
And this is what I suggest to you. I believe that a sheep nation is a nation, meaning a people group and or political geography that is influenced by the kingdom of God reigning in and through the hearts of men. That seems pretty clear from Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to the end. It's exactly why they're judged as such. But the reason why they exist there is because Christians now do something to make sure that they are there at that time. And I'm telling you, I do not see this ministry being limited in any way, shape, or form to any size of influence. See, I believe that ask of the Lord and he will give us the nations as an inheritance. Expand your thinking on just what God can call you to do. Look for the coming of Jesus Christ. Go for it. In the meantime, see, here's the thing. Look at it like this. I can meet a person on, 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 on the street. person has problems. Person tells me, oh man, I'm having a terrible time with this. And I say, wow, God has really, really touched my life in that area. Can I tell you, brother, this is what Jesus did for me. And this is what he's going to do for you. Let me pray for you. And as I pray for that person, the power of God hits them. They have a revelation and it changes their whole approach to life. They make new decisions. They have new results, and everything about their lives changed. Now, if that person is just your next-door neighbor, you know what? You've made an impact in a person's life. But in the same way that God can use a Christian to reach their next-door neighbor, God can use a Christian to reach a dictator over an entire nation. And when that Christian speaks the power of God into that leader's, that king's life, Changes that are made can affect entire national policy. It's the same thing. It's the same God. Why people get hung up. Why people think it's okay to reach your next door neighbor, but it's not okay to reach nations. I don't understand. I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. And people have this problem with this concept called um, the Seven Mountains. And, uh, you know, I did a show with Rob Skiba a little while ago, and we talked about the Seven Mountains being media, government, education, technology, economy, religion, celebration, and family, and about how God really wants people to be raised up as soldiers of his kingdom, as as ministers of his power, to go and infiltrate every area of these pillars of society as a part of his last day plan. What I want to tell you today, because I'm out of time, do not limit God and what he can do through you in these last days. God plans to touch nations, period. Whether you like it or not, whether your pastor likes it or not, he is going to do it. This is a heartbeat of God. The nations are the heartbeat of God. And this thing, this thing that I believe, firmly believe God wants to do through his people in the last days, is going to go far beyond anything we have dared to ask, think, or imagine. It took me years to come to the conclusion that God was telling me the truth as he was showing these things to me. And I pray that it doesn't take you that long. You've been watching Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. 90 God bless seconds. You. Good night. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. You write about it, how our leadership is wounding us. Can you tell us about this a little bit more? Yes, I'd love to. I wrote the book because of the the very thing that so many Christians are going through in that there's an epidemic where people are trying to do their best.
to get to know Jesus, yeah. to follow him, to fulfill the call on their lives, to be obedient, and yeah. so forth. The problem is, sometimes the biggest hurdles to, 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 to getting where God is calling us and calling people is the very leadership that they are trying to submit to. How do you do this? How do you get over wounds by leadership? One, forgive them. It's so easy. Because you set yourself free from everything they've done to you. When you forgive, a person then no longer has power to torment you, regardless of what they do, because you've forgiven them. This Jesus makes it very easy to understand. He, he says, if you don't forgive others on earth, my Father in heaven won't forgive you. He's trying to help us with that comment. And, wow. and the thing is that that power to forgive, you're not drawing that from your ideology. You're drawing that, again, from heaven itself. Your spirit man drawing on the power of God to forgive. So you're not even forgiving in your own power. How easy is that? When you get in touch with that, then it becomes your lifestyle. You, you can't get wounded after a certain point. Everything that we need to get healing and liberation and move beyond everything that man has dealt us it's found in Christ. We just have to believe it and choose to implement it. We may have to fast. We may have to, you know, I talk about forgive, write letters, invite the grace of God into our lives, exercise the presence of God, literally practicing the presence of God. You know, a lot of people don't know that you can purposefully enter the presence of God. And when you worship, the Bible says, we're going to have the praise of the people. What are you doing? In essence, when you truly worship God in spirit and truth, you're opening up a portal, a, a gateway to the very dimension where God is. And, and, and He will overshadow the whole environment which you're sitting in. When you go there, God's identity is Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. If you encounter God, you encounter healing.